Good afternoon. My name is Robert Straw. I'm the CEO of Sieb Switzerland. Welcome to today's uh, webinar. We're hosting the, the we're hosting from the Sieb Zurich campus, or at least I am in the Sieb Zurich campus. This is part of uh, the Sieb's webinar series, Lessons for Leaders from the Pandemic. This is the first webinar in a three-part series that we're hosting together with the Swiss Re Institute and our marketing partner, the Swiss Chinese Chamber of Commerce. The topic today is post-pandemic emergence of new business models. It's the ninth in, our webinar, in, in all of our webinar series of lessons for leaders from the pandemic. A little bit about SEEPS. Our rankings, we're fortunate enough to have a fifth place ranking for our MBA program, as well as our global EMBA program, ranked by the Financial Times. We're the, the equivalent of the number one business school in mainland China, and we were the first school in, in, uh, in China to receive both the Equus and the AACSB accreditations. Programs, uh, standard business school programs, uh, very top quality. We have 68 full-time professors, one of which will be with us on the call today. Uh, we have a, a very strong alumni association of 24,000 people globally. I'd like to mention very briefly, are we gonna show the other slide, Hannah? Okay, one, one plug before we move on. Well, we have a program called Leading at the Edge. I'd like to show you that. We'll be sharing this with you also after, at the end, when we send you the, the slides. One more, Leading at the Edge. It's a leadership journey, leadership development journey, hosted by and taught by Professor George Colarisa from IMD, as well as our own Catherine Shin, Professor Catherine Shin, Professor of Leadership Development and Organizational Development, taking place here in, in, in Switzerland from January 10th to 14th and in June of next year. I'd like to invite all the participants to use the functions of the, of the Zoom. If you've got a question for one of the panelists, one of the speakers, please use um, the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen so that we can uh, be curating the questions coming in. And when we get to the Q&A period, um, that we can ask those questions directly to the speakers of today. Thank you. Before we get on to talk about post-pandemic new business models, we need to remind ourselves of what a business model is. Um, so what is it? I like Michael Lewis's definition. Michael Lewis in 2015 said, it is how you plan to make your money. Very simple term about, it's a very, it can be very academic, but let's put it to the real core. It's how you planned to make your money. Microsoft, for example, when it was, when Bill Gates was setting up Microsoft, his goal and his, his business plan was to build software for 50 cents and sell it for 120. That was, that's the business model that he was proposing. The guru management thinker, Peter Drucker, he was known a lot about doing his, his work around business models and, and talking and writing about business. He said business models were assumptions about what a company gets paid for. Assumptions about what a company gets paid for. So that's some inputs as a, as a, as a reminder to you all about what is a business model. Before we introduce our speakers, uh, I'd like to have a couple warm-up questions with you, dear audience, uh, to poll you on a couple questions that we will also be using during the, the inputs. First question I'd like to ask you is, from a revenue point of view, to what extent has your business model changed in your company due to the pandemic? So 40 seconds in, we're seeing some, some trends here. And, not, and uh, trends that I think all of us would expect to see. So very clearly, and this is what I would have expected, is that business models are sticky. You can't change these in three months. Especially the larger the firm, the stickier the business model is, and the more embedded and entrenched we are into our strategy and our vision for what we're doing. So I think this would be interesting for you, Robert, and for Professor Kim to, to note, zero to 20% said that their business models have changed from a revenue perspective. Let's move to uh, 
the second question in the polling. How agile is your firm when it comes to making these types of changes or decisions? 60% um, of you have answered somewhat. Also not a surprising answer. Not at all. We have zero. Not very. We have uh, 7 percent, uh, seven people or 20 percent. And 20 percent of the people who responded said their firm is very agile. And therefore, I'd like to come to the third polling question, which has to do also with size of the firm. What's the size of your firm in terms of turnover? Because there's a clear correlation with agility and size, you would think. So it's interesting to see that uh, 31 percent of you are coming from micro sized firms and we would expect that you are a speedboat and that you can turn on a dime and change direction over a weekend. The multinational corporations, which is the, the by far the, the, the largest number of representatives on the call today, 34 percent say uh, so 34 percent of you are working for multinational corporations. So in the background, we'd like to see the correlation between these three questions. That's the interesting part going forward. Thank you very much for those inputs. We're going to continue to keep you active and thinking. Please write your Q&A questions at the bottom. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Kim, Professor Chung Young Kim. Uh, he's an pro assistant professor of strategy at SEEPS. His research and teaching is uh, focusing on corporate governance, on innovation and knowledge management. He's done a lot of work as a consultant and also in senior management at LG Economic Research Institute, as well as at LG Corporation. Robert Wiest is working at Swiss Re, our partner for this program, Swiss Re Institute. He's the chief operating officer for the reinsurance business of Swiss Re. In this role, he's responsible for leading the global reinsurance company strategy, as well as operations. He has significant experience in China having been the CEO of Swiss Re China in Beijing, and later the head of strategy and operations for Asia Pacific at uh, Swiss Re. Professor Kim, I turn the word to you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Let me, uh, let me share the screen first. Okay, hello everyone, nice to meet you. Uh, as I was introduced by Rob, uh, my name is Chang Yang Kim. It's a great honor to present this idea about the post-pandemic and the emergence of new business model. To, do, uh, to talk about post-pandemic, first of all, we need to uh, think about, uh, I cannot go down. Okay, now it's okay. Okay, first we need to talk about what is the pre-pandemic. To talk about post-pandemic, uh, we need to talk about what is uh, pre-pandemic. As we feel, experience this day one of the important characteristics which distinguish pre versus the post pandemic it is globalization first talk about what is globalization demand side underlying idea is very simple for example a local firm in country one they need to cover segment a b c d but mnc or global company rather than covering all the segments in a country they try to focus on, focus on a segment across countries. By doing that, they can launch a global product and maximize the economies of scale. That is the underlying idea of globalization. And at the same time, supply side, it's a global supply chain. For example, iPhone, as you have seen here, is assembled in China, but all different components come from all over the world. Korea, Japan, Taiwan, UK, Germany, and US. It is designed by US, but in terms of configuring value chain, global basis, global supply chain management, that is another important characteristics of pre-pandemic and globalization. At the context of a smile curve, look at this. This kind of smile curve most simple assembly happening in China and Taiwan. Designed by US Apple marketing, but the, this line component comes from many Asian countries, including uh, the companies Samsung, LG, and Taiwan, Japan, and Korea. That is global level of value chain configuration before, before the pandemic. 
So in this kind of uh, uh, circumstances, when you organize a company, multinational corporation, underlying idea is how to make a, a global organization. It is an example from the GE, G Medical System. It's called the global supply chain. If you look at that, there is a China and Asia, Korea, Taiwan, India, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, USA. Any kind of any a particular country organization is not self-sufficient. They are in the interdependent with each other. Finally, in your customer's country, they're going to assemble everything. But to, to make that happen, they should interdependent with each other. That is one of the important characteristics. By having such global organization, they can maximize the efficiency and they maximize economies of scale. That's what happened before the pandemic. But as you know, the pandemic caused by COVID-19 is the actually the size of coronavirus lockdowns. A lot of people cannot go to their workplace. Only they work at home as long as they don't need to work at manufacturing site. Even before the Europe, the US, they find a lot of the impacted numbers because their manufacturing facility located in China and Asia, their global supply chain failed to work as it is designed. So we experienced some deep dive, some recessions. Many people talk of all kind of recovery, L, U, V style. At least stock market these days shows that it's more like a V-style recovery from the pandemic caused by COVID-19. But we all of us know that this kind of pandemic is not over. The more fundamental pandemic is coming to us. What's next? All we know is some kind of trade war between USA and China, China and US. Underlying mechanism is simple. China is catching up. U.S. in terms of the whole country GDP. From the PPP perspective, some scholars said that China already overpassed U.S. So we need to prepare ourselves next pandemic, not caused by COVID-19. It's some kind of trade war between U.S. and China. But good thing is we are learning something from the pandemic caused by COVID-19. What are we learning? Before the, this pandemic, all the global organization, I just explained, it's under the Pax, Pax Americana. But now, after pandemic, G2, China, US, US, China, or Z0, because we don't have any dominant one. Some chaos is there. Under the Pax Americana, underlying purpose is all about cost minimization by just in time. But now, during this kind of pandemic, we realize that we need to hedge risk. To hedge risk, what is more important is not just in time, just in case. So under the global organization, cost minimization main agenda is, includes outsourcing, offshoring, by doing that, you can make a, an asset-like company, division of labor at the global basis. But nowadays, many companies, many government begin to talk how to integrate internalization, not internationalization, reshoring. It's not about the making asset-like company. How are you going to have much more real options? Sometimes you need to allow some redundancy. However, you have more real options, what kind of situations, what kind of pandemic, you have your own back plan. To do that, now the division of labor at the regional level, not the global level. Under the, before the pandemic, that's why all the global organization wanted to build an interdependent global organization. But nowadays we need to consider 
dual or triple regional organization. When you construct global network, you might need to have a dual or triple regional network. But each network is more self-sufficient except to research. We configure value chain from R&D, research and development, manufacturing, and the distribution and after service, or it can be still globalized, concentrate. But from development, each regional organization needed to have self-sufficient one. By having such a dual core, triple core, you can have, you can achieve just in case. Let me introduce a case. It's called In China for China by GE. G Medical System is the last chart. Before the, this kind of In China for China, G Medical System is under the GPC, Global Product Company. In China, there are three types of products, local made for local use, local made for export, imported for local use. But under the China for China, they deleted third category imported for local use. Within China, it becomes sufficient, sufficient one. So here, before the, this China for China, their production is a COE center of excellence, just focus on low end CT. But at the China for China, COE center of excellence for the world, low end CT, they have their local development for local use. By having this kind of development function, they can target existing East Coast urban area. They can reach to tier two, a rural area. I want to highlight the last one. When you, when the GE medical system executes this kind of thing, what they put much emphasis on, they try to make all the uh, subsidiary within China is more like wholly owned one. When you allow your foreign or international branch have a uh, sufficient structure, some kind of conflict of interest happen between the foreign branch and your own company. That's why in terms of ownership, in terms of corporate governance, you need to have strong control of power. That is the last one. So thank you, thank you uh, very much. Thank you everyone. I'm done, so we can talk more later. Go ahead, Robert. Professor Kim, thank you very much. We're going to come back to, I've, I've written down five or six questions coming in from the audience. I've been curating mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the content while listening to you, the, the, this, generating some ideas and some content from the audience that we're going to come back to after we hear from Robert. Robert, the floor Hi. is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, <clears throat> Rob. Thank you very much, Professor Kim, and thank you for having me. So I will build, continue building on what Professor Kim said in some aspects, slightly different angle. So for the next 10 minutes, I would like to offer you two hypotheses I want to elaborate on. The first one is globalization and global trade are here to stay and business models have to cater for that as they had in the past. Because they, during the crisis, there had been a lot of questions around onshoring, offshoring, uh, is, is, is the pandemic impacting global trade? And I believe it does, but the globalization and global trade flows will not go away by that. My second hypothesis is a very simple one. To be successful in the market, you need to be in the market. This will not change, but, and there are a lot of buts and we'll come to that. But first to globalization. So I think it's important to acknowledge that globalization as such is a very, very old phenomena. It's not something of the century. To give you some data pointers, Chinese silk was amongst the most expensive goods in the Roman Empire. So we're talking here two and a half thousand years ago. 80% of the silver used in China in the 16th century was coming from the mines of Potosi in Peru, via the Spaniards which was the very reason why Manila grew to a trading post, a significant trading post in that time as a consequence of the trade, uh, of that silver trade. And of course, most notably, the establishment of Hong Kong goes back to trade activities between the British Kingdom back then and, and China. So globalization is very old. The more important question is, why is it so old? 
And why is it that I believe it will not go away? Well, in essence, it goes back to our planet and how our planet has been constituted. Resources are not equally distributed on this planet and this drives trade flows. Unequal distributions have a tendency to balance out. In commercial terms, this is done via trade. And again, some data pointers here. Oil is not present where it's needed. It needs to be shipped and traded. Silver was not available when it was needed in China for tax collection. It had to be shipped and traded. With growing population, food needs to be imported. Take China, take Switzerland, take many, many other countries. Products are not produced everywhere. Take tea, take porcelain. Or China, as the Americans say, tells you already where the porcelain was coming from back in the times. And today, most probably most prevalent, low-cost labor force. So for all of that reasons, I strongly believe that the globalization is such and global trades and trade flows are not going to disappear. So the pandemic will slow it down. It will impact it for a while, but fundamentally it will not disappear. My second hypothesis, to be successful in the market, one needs to be in the market. Post-corona, what does that mean? We'll focus on two business models to highlight what I think is going to take place. The first one is the model of a distributed production chain. The beginnings of modern globalization, leveraging low cost labor force as we know it. And the second one is in essence sales and distribution in remote markets. A little bit going back to the one slide which Professor Kim had at the very beginning of his presentation. On the distribution, distributed production chain, certainly there's a lot of talk and I'm sure that nations and corporates will take a fresh look at what are the mission critical products in production chains post corona. I would expect to see that primarily in the pharma sector and of course in the medical supply sector. Those are the most obvious ones. A trend to increase stock at least or an outright trend to increase the onshore production ratio will take place. Will that be a larger trend? I don't think so. At the end, the benefits of the combination of low cost labor force, availability of products globally, skills and expertise will continue to drive the phenomena of distributed production chains. So what will change? The dependencies have to be better managed. From a risk management point of view, more local management control will be implemented. I will also think that we see a little bit less of just in time and more warehousing between the various elements of the distributed production chain to get it more robust and less susceptible to shock events. Again, I would not expect a massive insuring going to take place other than in some areas in some very specific industries. At the end, the drivers for offshoring or onshoring are more driven by labor costs, regulatory fiscal measures, availability of skills and expertise, and many more. Moving to the local distribution and distribution in this context, I would take it as local distribution, local production, local presence in general in a, in a given market. Clearly to be successful in a given market, one needs to understand customer needs. If you distribute, if you produce, you still need to know in which environment you're operating, whether this is a market environment, whether it's the legal environment, fiscal environment, or any other framework. This is true for the global brands, the big multinationals, as it's true for small enterprises. If you don't know what situations you're getting yourself into it, it usually spells for problems and trouble. The successful companies across the globe are spending considerable efforts in securing these aspects, and that will not change. If you do not know what your customer needs, you will not sell. If you don't know in which environment you're getting into it, again, it will, your life will be difficult. All companies have therefore a business model which secures a local presence in one form or the other, via joint ventures, wholly owned subsidiaries or other constructs. All of them had experiences leading them to a local presence, at least for key markets. The interesting thing is because at that point, the question comes up frequently, what about the digital distribution channels? Take an Apple. Well, if you come to China, Apple has set up a considerable local footprint. So yes, the digital models, they're also uh, subject to these conditions. 
The degree of freedom to operate for these local entities depends on corporate culture, history, partners, at the end on many parameters. Most of them are historically gone and have been rooted deeply in the corporate culture. Some of these entities are very independent, some are centrally controlled and steered. Overall, I believe that this is the area where we'll see the impact of Corona playing out, very much along the lines of what Professor Kim said out in his slides. Let's take a closer look at that. Now, what happened in Corona? Different countries and markets went into shutdown at different times. This impacted communication, flow of personnel, the reporting cycles, and many more aspects. The pressure on reaction time, transparency of decision-making for the local management has increased considerably, and the challenges within these organizations has increased as well. In order to cater for that going forward, more resilient setup is needed to secure the relationships between the local entity present in the markets and the global entities, whether this is a headquarter or any other structure. I believe that this change in the relationship will translate into five areas. There will be most probably more, but I think the five are the most prominent or most important ones. Of course, in different shades of gray, depending on the organization, governance. For those companies who are more centrally controlled, you will see a move to more local control. It will need stronger governance to define the relationship between the local entity and a global entity. And I think that applies to multinationals as well as a small and mid-sized enterprise of which a lot here in Switzerland have gone also, for example, to China. You have exactly the same dynamics playing out. So governance will play an increasing role to keep the oversight and maintain the integrity around your operations. Decision-making and decision autonomy. From a central decision-making, it will move to more local decision-making. This is a big cultural change for companies used to run centrally steered organization. One example, more from the uh, multinational uh, world, a global matrix organization versus the local hierarchy. Difficult to reconcile. A very important point I regard the leadership selection. You will have to rely more on good quality local management. So owners, managers will have to spend considerable more time in finding the right people with the right skills. That will of course drive also an upscaling of local capabilities, but companies in general will have to upscale their management and leadership capabilities. Culture, corporate culture, most probably the biggest challenge. Again, particular for organizations who run usually a more centralized approach where the decision-making is taken in the headquarter. It needs to go more to the local um, entities. And the last part I would like to mention is digitization. There will be an increased demand to support these changes in those areas on the basis of digital platforms because you need to somehow ensure and increase the transparency of decision-making, the transparency around control processes, and think about it as an example in integration of local warehousing and local sales systems into global systems. Not an easy task. The last word to that, I believe in particular that European organizations will be challenged more than American-based entities for a very simple reason always in relation to Asia. And the simple reason is time zones. If one takes a closer look on organization forms and the empowerment of local management of American entities or North American entities operating in China, they have in average a higher degree of management autonomy. Why? It's much more difficult to communicate across a time zone which is just not synchronized. If you look into European, uh, central centered companies, they're sitting in the middle time zone. So it's much easier to maintain a central control over your entities wherever they are. So with the changes I depicted, the cultural change aspect is going to be much higher for companies sitting in the time zone, which is makes it easier to communicate. To conclude, 
I believe we will see a continuation of global trade and therefore globalization. Business model will see a trend to a more local empowerment with a subsequent drive to a stronger governance, catering for that and upscaling of labor force quality in the local markets. All of that will be supported by an increase in digitization of governance and performance measurement processes. The underlying fundamentals, so the drive for global trade and the vicinity to customers will not change, however. Many thanks for your attention. And with that, I would give it back to Rob. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Professor Kim. Um, I'd like to address one question that came through about a little bit of a, a challenge that we have here is that Professor Kim, if we understand it right, you're, you're, you're proposing this uh, shift away from regionalization or from globalization to a, this duality or triple view. And Robert, you're saying actually in a way the opposite. We are going to stay local and we are going to stay global. How do we reconcile this? I think the, <clears throat> the two statements so the way I, re I see it and will be interested to hear them, Professor Kim, I think we are more or less saying something very similar. Uh, you will always have, particularly for, for actually not only multinationals, you will always have the, the base, the root where a company is coming from, whether it's a small one or a big one. There are of course examples also in China where a Swiss company has entirely moved over into a different market. You have those examples as well, but we leave them aside. I think what we're saying is you will keep that route. So there's always a global presence, but you have a much more local empowerment and local setup. Whether this is a regional one or it's fully local, I would say it's largely driven by, by market size. Mm -hmm. But I think that trend to more local decision-making, more local autonomy, more local management empowerment, that, that will have to come. Because if you don't move in that direction, a similar event, will create exactly the same impact. It will slow down, it will shut down your operations to, to a certain degree. So let me, yeah. let me before, before Professor Kim, before you comment on that, let me make a, um, an observation with also with leadership or, or management theory. Traditionally, most, a lot of management theory originates in the US, it migrates to Europe and then to Asia. And so a little bit, you know, Ch China's left, let's say specifically China, how is, how are Chinese firms going to react to this type of proposition to be that their European German operations, for example, are going to need to be much more autonomously run in the future? This, this is, uh, from the cultural change perspective, this is pretty radical, more radical for a average Chinese firm than it would, will be for an average American or European firm. I Professor Kim, you want Robert, you go first. So I, I, I think, yes, you're right. It's radical. I think one of the consequences will be the European and so the foreign entities operating in China, they will become more Chinese, mm -hmm. evidently. That's one. Two, the labor force market for the, for the talents, which are knowledgeable and can operate in both worlds, in both corporate cultures, which is anyway already a very, very, very shallow market that will get even shallower. Mm -hmm. yeah. Over time, it will balance out. You will see more talents who know how to govern both worlds, but that will be the pressure point from my point of view. Okay, Professor Kim? Yes, Remy responded to Robert's uh, the, the presentation or his point. As he mentioned, we are talking uh, same direction. So that always there are two extremes, globalization versus localization. So anyway, so that before the pandemic, that this, uh, he, it is located here, globalization. But we are not saying it can go back to this way. So we are going to meet the, in the middle ground. Okay. I want to call it more like a regionalization. Anyway, the Robert mentions the directionality goes to localization. But as he mentioned, globalization become essence. It cannot back to totally localize the country by country, no. So we need to find some uh, middle ground. That's why I call it regionalization. Not every time multi, 
it's just a dual or a triple mm -hmm. uh, self-sufficient core networks. That's first thing. Second thing, you talk about some leadership style or some kind of entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial leadership in China. So based on the, my observation in Korea, it is the thing, in the beginning, when you, each company can grow with the country itself, it is very hard for you to tease out national level competitive advantages from firm level um, competitive advantages. But as time goes on, each firm is going to have their own face. Mm -hmm. They're going, they should, and they're going to find their own firm level advantages. Mm -hmm. So what I can tell as time goes on, even though all the Chinese companies are called the Chinese company, they're going to have a different faces and different leadership style would emerge. I think I can find a similar thing in US and Europe. Mm -hmm. So currently we often call it Chinese company, but as time goes on, each Chinese company needed to have their own firm level advantages. For example, this day, Huawei is very different from Xiaomi. Xiaomi is very different from Huawei. Their leadership style is also very different from each other. So sometimes we cannot impose this kind of big umbrella called the Chinese company anymore. As time goes on, we are going to find some uh, differentiation across Chinese companies, leadership style too. That's what I want to mention. Thank you. I, I do have a question coming back to the, to the L, the U, and the V curves that you mentioned. Now, that's market data. Market data doesn't necessarily match what's happening operationally. So mm -hmm. regardless of what's happening at the market side, because markets are very fickle, they're very <laughs> strange, you know, but on the operation side, what are we seeing and what are we witnessing on the shift to new business models very specifically? So we've been kind of talking at a meta level about general shifts. What are you, what are you witnessing? What are you seeing very specifically and the shift of business models that is, is happening? Me or yeah, Robert? Okay. Yeah, I can, I, can, I can give you a couple of examples from our own company. The, on the point of shifting management decision power. So very concrete example. Clearly Asia was going into lockdown way before anyone else starting in China and then the rest of Asia following. Now we are running um, emergency procedure. So we have business continuity management on various levels, local, regional, and centrally. Now, no manager is going to shut down an entire location without having talked to the entire organization. Now, if you have units which have experienced SaaS, talking about the lockdown is not that far away from your imagination. Now you come to the headquarter and you talk about a shutdown of a location or maybe even a region, and this has a totally different quality. Mm -hmm. And when you go then into the individual measures, what you're going to do, you're trying as local manager to ask for, here's my list of things I want to do. What do you think about that? and you don't get necessarily right away a good response because the people who have subject to that and need to scrutinize and take a position had never to do that. And, and so when we came to that point, we, we had to say, you know what? This is within your local decision power. You know best how to handle the situation. Here's the framework which we believe we have to have in order to safeguard, should we go into lockdown in other locations, which happened then subsequently, but largely it was within the local management this, uh, power to decide how they want to deal with that. And, and, and those are for me examples. I am absolutely sure that some of that will translate into business decision-making over time as well. And but that what? brings you then to this regionalization, which Professor Kim has talked, or I'm talking more about uh, the local, regional. For me, that's a bit in the same in the same area. But then you have a, a clear uh, a clear challenge on the risk side of the company. You know, you're working for a risk management company. This is what your company does, Robert, in managing and and, yep. and 
basically buying and selling risk, right? Um, through packages, call it what you want, but that's how my simple definition. It's a good definition. Um, so when this is adding an additional layer un, of, I'll be provocative, of unnecessary risk to do this, we should keep things central. I'm being provocative intentionally to, to press the no, point. No, not, not at all, because that's exactly how we run it, right? So when it comes to risk and, and not necessarily the individual risk assessment. So example, an underwriter in Beijing office deciding to take on this risk. We have a full framework, which gives totally local decision power for risk within a certain size. If it grows bigger, it certainly has to go up precisely for that, because at the end, we, we take the risk on our balance sheet and that you must control. It has to be a central process. And, and, and the, the, the trick is, and the difficulties is in defining where the transition lines are, the border lines. And that's a constant process. Because of course, local units want to have more freedom. Centrally allocated people want to have more control. So it's like in any other organization where human beings are working together, it has to be a healthy and positive, constructive discussion. And then you usually land at a good, in a good setup. Yeah. So I'd like to come back to this point too, that you brought up already last week in our pre-discussion, we were talking about the concept of time and the strategic advantage and the strategic location of, let's say North America and this disjoin because of time, that it has an advantage vis-a-vis -vis European firms, vis-a-vis -vis Chinese. How can, how can the European firms mitigate this and, and find a way around it to get back in that game? Now, first, it's a, it's a phenomena, again, which you can't change, right? So all of our, everyone has figured out a way to deal with that. So the, American companies, they've realized very early, look, if I have, and it's a very human behavioral thing. If I want to keep control of that, I have to stay awake the night or wake up early in the morning. So I'm not going to do it. Here's a management process and a risk management process, which gives you the autonomy. And we do it via reporting and performance measurement and a lot of other things. Mm. Whereas in the Europe context, well, you can afford to have a call in the morning or lunchtime. It's not a problem. So you, you have many more human touch points and all of that is reflected also in the management frameworks, which you have. Now the stress point comes up if you change that. Like I, do, I, I just presented, yeah, you will see in the European companies a move towards a more, let's call it for the simplicity of the term, an American way of running a company. So an empowerment of the local companies then the Americans will have to move a little bit less, but all of that comes with the risks. There are multiple examples of American subsidiaries having gone local mm -hmm. because they lost control of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which this model clearly exposes you much more of that. Yeah. Um, so it comes always with a cost and a benefit, but I'm reasonably sure with the reasons which we laid out, you will see for European companies a bit more stress, not a lot, because we all learned how to deal with that, but you have to give the local people more empowerment or the regional ones. One way to mitigate is you will upscale consciously or unconsciously your management. You will. Yeah, I think it's uh, a big opportunity for European companies. One globalized network, which means every country is not self-sufficient. Now, US, China or China, US, they wanted to construct their own network but they are not self-sufficient. They need to find partners. It usually from not China, not from US. It's from US looking for some partners from Asia, Europe. China also looking for partners from Europe and Asia. It's a double or triple. So as long as you are dispensable, as long as you have something to give each natural, which means the opportunity itself doubled up. So that's why it means some opportunities. That's the first thing. Second thing, back to the Rob's initial point, L versus U versus V, the stock market, just the expectation. Until now, they expect V, but we don't know. But one thing we can tell is this, unlike war, 
there is no destruction in all the production means, factories, still there. That's one thing. And we have all the digital solutions. During this pandemic, we realized that digitization cannot replace 100%. Still, we need analog. Still, we need human touch. But at the same time, for a while, this kind of digitization can help us running our company without face-to-face -face contact. That is another truth we have found. That's why many analysts, the stock market, expect some V-style uh, recovery, even these factors. That's the, the other one. And so, uh, and uh, I saw some kind of question from Margarita Nostro, whether or not this kind of pandemic is going to accelerate the China for China. Absolutely, yes. Uh, let me share one story. Today, I saw some Korean article. Some ambassador, Chinese ambassador in Korea today shared that after this big conference in China, they have a big, big, large instruction plan and building of all the infrastructure to recover from pandemic. And this Chinese ambassador said to Korean companies, this kind of opportunity is open to Korean companies too. Please join. So the, this kind of, as I mentioned earlier, self-sufficient network, in other, another name is in China for China. Mm -hmm. So that kind of network, kind of things and plans, U.S. quantitative releasing all the money is released. China, they also released all the money. Mm -hmm. Still, so the barriers are there, but which means from the perspective of the company, European companies or Asia companies, some big opportunities are uh, awaiting for us. Mm -hmm. So we need to prepare how to join yeah. such plan as an insider. That that's the one kind of uh, uh, projection or expectation and from my side. Yeah, I would add to that if you look how the GDP composition has developed over the last take 20 years in China you saw very clearly 20 even 10 years ago you saw very clearly infrastructure investments and in essence export so the workbench of the world if you look today, the service aspect, the service component of GDP has increased significantly. If I'm not totally wrong, the latest numbers even show that it's a dominating factor. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Chinese economy has changed from an export-focused economy to an inward-focused economy, not too dissimilar to the US. So, it means over time that all the companies who are still using China as a workbench are running against the clock because labor costs are going up. Some companies like the textile industry has shifted already out to Bangladesh and Turkey. Interesting, Bulgari in Europe, interesting as well. But it's an, it's an ending game. And other companies are coming more and more to China because it's a market for their products. And that will continue to grow. Why? It's 1.5 billion people. GDP in the most simple term is defined by number of people, the time they work and how efficient they are. And it's one formula you can use. So that will continue. And that means China will not be autonomous for a lot of other reasons, certainly not on food supply and energy supply, but it is a region at itself, mm -hmm. very clearly. And we, we acknowledge like that. Uh, for us, we look into Asia and we look into China from a resource set up from an investment point of view, precisely for that reason. I, I fully agree with you. So currently China, China reached to $10,000 per capita GDP. So from that point, consumption drive economic growth. Before that, investment and manufacturing, after 10000 per capita, is a consumption and the service is going to drive the older economic growth. So mm -hmm. we are talking about business model change. It's a high time for China to change their own business game, how to develop their country. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's going to be a very different game. So all the, the when I show this kind of smile curve, the area this here, simple assembly, 
this kind of function will be shifted to Vietnam or Malaysia or all other East Asia countries. They are moving up this way. It's more like integrated manufacturing. It is a highway from here to here, Xiaomi service distribution. They outsource all the manufacturing. Chinese company, Chinese economy itself evolves from the, on the smile curve, the bottom part, they are moving this way. Mm. It's, it's based on their big domestic market. So the, all the foreign companies can have uh, some chance of coming three or five years. After three or five years, I don't know whether or not still the window is open, but at least three or five years is a good time for you to be an insider and catch the wave of economic Chinese economic growth driven by service industry and uh, consumption driven economic growth. Interesting. Um, I have another question coming in from the audience on, has to do a little bit on the control issue, control and governance with, uh, with regulation. And the question comes in from we, it says, will corporate, uh, the corporate regulatory landscape get more fragmented, not just the governance, but the regulatory environment. And what are the risks about that? I'm not a legal, legal expert, but anyway, so, but the Chinese, uh, whole Chinese tends to be more centralized these days. But uh, when you just look at, uh, I don't think it's going to be more fragmented, but a global basis, US style, Chinese style, Europe style, in that sense, it, get, it can be more fragmented. I don't know exactly the, uh, what the question is asking, but that's my expectation, but I'm not expert in this kind of regulation. Uh, to fully agree with that. A lot of my time goes into that topic. Uh, so it's exactly the same thing on a global scale, more fragmentation, more pain. It goes against, for example, big topic for us, the global financial safety net, because companies like us, we are reinsured, last man standing in the value chain of transferring risks. Now we're operating our balance sheet on a global basis. Now, if we have to fragment that in order to comply with all the local regulations, you undermine that, that role. So it's a big topic, globally, yes. In a country like China, where that stuff is centralized, no, absolutely not, exactly as Professor Kim said. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, there, there was a question coming in about Hong Kong right now. It's somewhat, uh, David Meyer came in. Um, I, this is not a political forum. It's about business. Business is affected and affects politics, but we don't talk about politics directly. But I, having said that, I will ask the question. What changes do you expect for foreign companies operating in China from the new security measures for Hong Kong? Will equity listings and local equity establishments move out of Hong Kong to, for example, Singapore? Or will Western firms more or less ignore these security changes? Any thoughts on that? I have a <laughs> I have a very simple take on it, but maybe too simplistic. Take a very close look at the financial marketplaces in Asia. And there's only one international financial place, only one. That's right. Why? The Tokyo and Osaka stock exchanges, they cater for Japan and Japan financing, financing economy and financing the government. If you take the public listings of companies outside of Asia coming to Hong Kong to list, quite some, less so and lately, of course, but it's truly an international financial place. If you compare the size, for example, to Singapore, well, there's no comparison. Now, in the most simple way, if you're sitting there and you have to decide what to do with that, I have only one question. Are you going to kill the golden goose? Certainly not. That's right. So that's a very simple answer I can give you, but it's my personal judgment. Time will tell, but well, I don't think it will impact that role. Coming from a business perspective and quite pragmatic, right? Um, yeah. yeah. It's a, a pragmatism pushes. I have one final question. Is there a link with all of this and changing business models? Again, as we're talking across east to west and west to east of learning from each other and bridging is there a link to pr the purpose of profit? The purpose of profit? 
and the question of purpose in firms now? I think I think it's the, 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 the question has to be a different one, Robert. I think if you run a business, you incur costs. So you certainly want to cover costs and profits for me, that's part of your decision to do a commercial undertaking. You can't separate that. Cost, revenues, profit, products, it's all part of the one game. I think the broader question is, what are you, your ethics around it? What mm -hmm. is your moral foundation around it? Are you driving profits at any cost or are you operating your business framework under an umbrella of ethical values? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, ethical values are driven by culture. You're operating it and you, you're coming from, so there are different notions to it. But I think that's the bigger question. All societies have a limit what they consider ethical or unethical. And I think that's the, 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 the more important question rather than profits. Because profits, the moment you have decided to go for a non-commercial undertaking, yeah, you expect profits, of course. You. Otherwise, you set up an NGO which has a different purpose for very good reasons. It shouldn't have profits. Professor Kim, any comments from you? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, Rob, you, you try to do your best to separate out the politics from business for business from politics. But as we have just observed, when there is a tension between these two big two, the, the line, between politics and business becomes more like blood. Mm. How does the tease out? The same thing, how do you define profit? Without this kind of tension, it can be simple from the perspective of shareholders. Mm -hmm. But when this kind of tension goes up, goes up, goes up means uh, national government becomes much more important stakeholders on top of shareholders. So uh, the, I don't, I'm not sure whether or not I understand your question in correct manner, but what I can tell is this, it's very sure. We don't know exact for the line, but anyway, mm -hmm. as time goes on, you need to consider more, not just profit for shareholders, profit for national government or this kind of political tension or job growth, job creation, or you can call it CSI, whatever it is. It's, it's a driven by or imposed by this kind of new normal. That's, the, that's my comment. Thank you. Gentlemen, we're closing the hour. Um, I'd like to thank you both very, very much. I'd like to thank the Swiss Re Institute for being a part and being a, uh, a partner in this. I'd like to thank the Swiss uh, Chinese Chamber of Commerce for being a marketing partner on this, on this particular webinar series. We're going to be sending a follow-up mail to all of the participants who joined us today. And thank you participants for asking all these great questions. We're gonna send you a follow-up mail with some slides from uh, Professor Kim, as well as some information and as well as the recording. I will also include in that record, in that, in that mail also for you, Robert and Professor Kim, a link to the webinar that was done by Pascal Lamy. Pascal Lamy, the former head of the WTO, we recently yep hosted him and he had very similar thoughts in, a, in a, obviously in a different direction about multilateralism, globalism and regionalization that you might be quite interested in, in hearing about and being in touch with him. He's one of our uh, visiting professors at, uh, at, uh, at SEEPS. Thank you again thank you to much. all of you, uh, Mr., uh, Mr., Mr. Kim and Robert, thanks so much. Thank you very thank much you. for having us. Thank, thank you to the audience. Bye. Have a good Bye. day. Bye.